Hey, Dave Melinda here, Positive Polarity Podcast. Hope things are going awesome for you. As you know, every week I do my diligence to find people that are awesome at what they do. And I was actually really intrigued by this question that I'm going to start with, and then we're going to unpack a little bit of that today. And actually, I found it on Carol Sanford's website. It said, how toxic is your organization? So we're going to unpack that a little bit. Thank you so much, Carol, for joining us. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for asking me. Absolutely. We're honored to hang out with a five-time author. So uh, five awesome books out there. So um, great wisdom there. I'm looking forward to uh, getting into that. And a recipient of the Lifetime Trust Award. Tell us, what is that? I'm intrigued by that. There's a group called Trust Across America that promotes um, a, whole, a set of standards about what it means to work on trust. And every year they acknowledge a group of people they in their estimate are meeting their standards and they have uh, a group of companies and then a group of educators change agents and so i managed to i mean i was very honored to repeatedly get it so finally they said ah let's just do it for life <laughs> easier than giving you an award every year right just make yeah, it a light yeah That's they're great. good people it's called trust across america trust across the world i believe okay great that's awesome and you've done work with uh people like google and dupont intel procter and gamble and delivering extraordinary results so you know i look at this and i think who doesn't want number one results, but you're talking about extraordinary results. So yeah. tell us a little bit about what you're doing and, um, you know, what, what you're about and, uh, you know, share with the audience. We are dying to hear. Well, I'm happy to share with you. I should tell you why we can call it extraordinary. I didn't make that up. That's what, uh, the CEOs of many of those companies wrote in the forward of my books, because they stated they could grow, uh, for the first five years with what we did, which I'll describe a bit, sure. uh, grew 35 to 65% in revenue per year. Wow. Uh, that's And that's even in uh, low, usually low margin commodity kind of businesses. How do you do okay. that? Wow. So the, you want the answer to how we do that now, right? <laughs> <laughs> nah, let's make them write or read all five of your books, you know? Yeah. Well, and you know by the way, there's... There's a six went out in October. Oh, um, great. Awesome. Well, you know how it is, Carol. Everybody's looking for that piece of advice, that silver bullet. Everybody's looking for that one tidbit, you know, that's going to change. And usually we wait till the end to ask that. But just since you brought it up, I'm going to just yeah. uh, fire it back at you. If there was a tip of the week from Carol Sanford, what would that be for anybody listening? Quit looking for that. Stop. <laughs> Don't ask. It's the most ridiculous question because um, my new book is called Indirect Work, which basically says that you don't work on anything. Anybody can give you advice. Don't take it. Okay. My philosophy is education. So I'm not a consultant. I'm not a mentor. I'm not a, 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 a coach. I work with companies over long periods of time to build capability and consciousness to be able to see how the world works, literally. Uh, and the rhythm with which we work is a big part of it. So this is why you can't take any one thing I give you. you I meet with them at least a day a month okay. uh, for three to five years. Okay. And the uh, real key there is they're getting a different way to think, a way to learn to question themselves, to not accept anything anyone else gives you. The biggest thing you can do to harm your company is to take someone else's advice. Because it, it's like, would you tell, go around when you're raising children and say, how do you raise your children? And you copied that immediately. You, If you kind of used it to push off of, that's something right. different. There are three things I start with. None of these you can do in a hurry and you're lying to yourself if you think you can. <laughs> the first is what is the essence and the founding of that company? So like with DuPont, we went back to EI DuPont. Now he was long dead, so we couldn't talk to him directly, but we had a lot of historians, a lot of info and what we found and it caused DuPont to change 
Well, I'll tell you that first. There, uh, this first. Their essence we found with EI was managing risk. He had been responsible to the last King of France for managing all the munitions safely. Mm. And when he fled for his life and came to Connecticut, he created a dynamite factory. And oh, wow. that whole thing was done in a way that he built a wall between his family and the factory to ensure everyone did it safely. That's how dedicated he was. Mm. So we went back in DuPont to its founding, then looked at everything they do. And Chad Holly, who was chairman, CEO, and president at the time, and wrote the forward to my first book, said, all right, what are we doing that we can't manage the risk? No one can. We shouldn't be doing it. They sold off businesses. I'm not going to tell you the name. They're all chemical names, but, <laughs> uh, and then moved into industries. People needed to have risk managed like far, um, farm fishing, which can contaminate the oceans and building the kind of farming that could protect the oceans and keep fish from becoming ill. So the first thing you do is find out who you are. Sure. And okay. that's quite a bit of work. Uh, yeah, I do what I call an essence reveal. And often I have the founder, like Seventh Generation or Numi T. Uh, and you actually go do a set of work to find out not what their personality is, not what they're good at, but literally who they are and how they live their life. Okay. You then begin to embed that in everything you do. So if you're managing risk, you start to sell off by we did uh, mergers acquisitions um and you start to hire people based on their attraction to that so we spent time asking people who worked in dupont why did you come here uh and showed them this managing risk idea and ask how that would influence them if that were the heart of everything they did each and every one of them, I didn't talk to myself, but I heard, I sure. said, that's why I came here. I'm a chemical engineer, PhD in chemistry, and I wanted to work in a place I could make a difference. I didn't work, work in an irresponsible place that creates Bhopal. So you then begin to develop what that means in every profession. And then you begin to look at products and how do you manage products? How do you do it in... Uh, packaging, everything you do fits your essence. It will take you to being a responsible company. Okay. So, you know, and thanks for sharing that, Carol. It's a situation where I think about the average person listening might be a smaller entrepreneur business yeah. owner, you know, type of situation where, you know, like I was in my past life, I had, you know, 22 yeah. people on my team and, you know, we were doing 10 million in annual sales and life was good. And, all, and, and I'm thinking about how do I stop long enough to figure out who I am or how do I stop long enough to, you know, ask that question about being toxic. So, you know, are there not shortcuts, but are there abridged versions of some of this stuff that you're able to, you know, for not the large company like a DuPont or something like that, that you're talking about? Is it situations that there are different levels of your programs for people? Um, there are different formats for sure. Okay. Let's take a really tiny company that has grown into a huge one because every entrepreneur listening would like to grow either large or be acquired or go public. Sure. Seventh generation, which I handed out, makes non-toxic paper products and household products. When I started with them, they were the size of your company, 25 people. Okay. Uh, in that process, we started with the founder. And the, the one th question you can ask that will get you in the ballpark, I, I don't want anybody to then stick with it because the kind of work it takes to really find essence is um, a, kind of like a lifetime of work. You get closer and closer and closer. With Jeffrey, we could see in his history that what he had consistently been pursuing was uh, integrity in messaging. Okay. He, if he saw a company like Walmart who said one thing and did something else, you know, talked out two sides of the mouth, he was on the press. He was somewhere. He was demonstrating getting arrested. Unbelievable number of things to call attention to that. 
and transparency. So we said, all right, that's who you are. Okay. And he, that's who you've been since you were young. What is it that seventh generation ought to be doing? Because when I met them, they were not making money. They'd been in business a decade or more, and they were still not making money because they were copying other people's ideas, trying to be social good citizens, but they weren't paying any attention to their products. As we looked at that, we said, how could we demonstrate full transparency, full integrity? And we created the very first social responsibility report. Hmm. And that report showed them everything to uh, seventh generation, 25 people remember yep. everything that they were doing, put into a report, including all the mistakes they made, what they were pursuing, asked people to call them up if they saw places that were out of integrity. We created product lines to work with um, a group called Wages in San Francisco, which were Hispanic women who were working for other people cleaning houses, one of the most dangerous professions because of the toxic chemicals. Sure. When we get, uh, worked with them to get seventh generation products in there, we also worked to create co-ops. So they were running their own businesses. And that part took care of Jeffrey's, uh, another aspect of his essence, which was social justice. It took off and Jeffrey is one of the people who says, my goodness, we're making products. Most people uh, get two, 3% margins and get so little revenue off of that. He was the yeah. first one who said, 35 to 65 percent growth a year in our products and that came from finding out who he was can you get a feel for what i did with him yeah well so yeah and that's awesome i think a lot of entrepreneurs don't want to slow down they don't want to take their foot off the gas to really find out who they are right why do i care why you know so i appreciate yeah. that you you shared that and sometimes we struggle with that connection of really understanding who we are and what does that really have to do with yeah. growth, right? So I think if you can bridge that gap for us a little bit. So let's say that I'm a, you know, an average business owner where I have 25 people similar to your seven generations, um, you know, project. If I'm like that and I see that I do want to grow um, and I say, okay, you know, I want to find out who I am. I mean, is that a long process for you guys to kind of unpack that or, or kind of how does that, what does that look like once you get so somebody? I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to say this again. I get close to it with them. The first conversation, okay. we keep coming back to it and getting closer. If okay. you think about who you are, Dave, don't you know who you are much better than you did five years ago or 10 years yeah, ago? Absolutely. What yep. you're so that's what finding essence about sure. finding okay. who you are is not a test you take off of the cover of cosmopolitan magazine okay. gotcha. and now you know what kind no okay. uh i do a bit of that and you ask about different levels i mean obviously when i'm working with dupont or people like google i yeah. mean big groups but when i work right now people come and we've got 10 companies in the room for very little money because I can put 10 together over a year, two years, three years to redesign the whole company, including sure. um, wages, how, how you pay and progression, that kind of thing, unless it be pretty cheap, you're meeting three hours a month. Okay. And then you go off and do some work with other people and you will grow you. So entrepreneurs have to get used to the idea that it's not about getting the latest trick or best practice but about growing steadily every week, yeah. applying what you learn. So I say to people, you're going to learn some stuff this week. You're going to learn how to do essence reveal for customers, which is more important. Well, no, not important. It's equally as important as understanding the essence of your company. Who are your buyer nodes? So for seventh generation, we had um, uh, natural parents, parents who were concerned about their kids health and vitality and the planet and they mm -hmm. were trying to get those together we then begin to develop products for that particular essence characteristic okay. and the people flooded to us did a project with uh babies or us which doesn't even exist now but it was a steep growth and when we came back to jeffrey i said now let's look at your essence and the essence of company better 
and we got tighter and tighter down to what we we're doing and now what each of our customers were. So this doesn't look anything like what you will get in business school. That's why I critique Harvard Business Review on my business second opinion podcast, because sure. people are being given stuff that they can quote, go apply right now, top yeah. tips, and it isn't worth the, the paper it's written on. You <laughs> got to do the deep work. Sure. So then I have a question that kind of ties in here because is it safe to say that if you know who you are and your customer knows who they are and you're similar, is the likelihood of success a lot higher when they're uh, similar in that? Yeah, similar is not the word. Uh, okay. But the idea you have is right. So let me okay. tell you what the right part of that is. Yeah. What I call it is an essence to essence connection. Okay. But they're not the same as you. It's like you don't want, I mean, you and your spouse or your two children are not getting along because they're alike. Nope, they're often opposites. Okay. But if they understand each other and you have a principle like seventh generation did, is we take what we are, who we stand for, because the company becomes whatever the founder's essence was. The minute that is put out in the world, it will begin to attract. Uh, so we attracted natural parents, right? With this new venture. Gotcha. Okay. Once you have that, you're now growing from wisdom. Okay. What are they about? Where are they going? Who are you? How can you do something together? It's like a marriage made in heaven, but it's not because you're alike, but it is because you are growing one another and doing what makes the other uh, gotcha. more able. So in your website, you talked about, you know, like these four ways of um, working and one of them was create exceptional customer loyalty. So do you end up with that? I mean, does that create that loyalty then when you both know each other and understand that essence to well, essence connection? Well, you have to know how to use it. The answer okay. is it gives you the door. Uh, gotcha. And one of the things that's really important is you have everyone in your organization. So in seventh generation, we had 25 people. Uh, they now, they were bought by Unilever a few years ago. So now they're hundreds or thousands of people. Okay. But you have each of them become innovators for the customer. So now you've got S Susan, we'll say, who is in seventh generation, who now understands natural parents. She came up with the idea of a partnership with Babies R Us. Okay. And she went in and educated the Babies R Us people about the uniqueness of seventh generation's diapers and baby care products. And also work with them to create a program where the babies or us could make money, but she worked with each individual in a group uh, salesperson who now got very excited about they could help educate parents. Now, parents now want to go to a store where they can get information and the uh, seventh generation continuously educated the babies or us sales force and also um, uh, some, uh, buyers Mm -hmm. about how it is they could work with parents. That's very different than discounting the price and selling in bulk. You yeah. know, none of that creates loyalty. What creates yeah. loyalty is you've got my back. You're innovating for me. You have everyone on your staff in seventh generation, in uh, business, innovating for me, the parents. We did some of the first um really great websites to get those people talking to each other, local communities sure. where parents could come together. Wouldn't that grow loyalty? I, sure. You're clearly on my side. And that's, I mean, that's, those are such great points, Carol, because I think we, we limit ourselves as business owners on what that means to have a loyal customer and how to get one. And so yeah. I think the wider that we can cast that net, the wider vision, I mean, that's a great point that you start looking at where are the customers and, you know, how can I help them not even relating to our product, so to speak, and it naturally right. comes, you know, comes around. So then that also, you know, kind of ties into that toxic piece. So yeah. how do you, you know, toxic organizations today are everywhere. 
And unfortunately, I think there's a lot of businesses that have blind spots that don't realize that it's happening. So I saw that you take the quiz button. There's a spot where you take a quiz and, you know, you get to, I don't know what happens. I was kind of afraid to do it. So I just was like, I'm going <laughs> to well, ask Carol. So, I'll tell you. you. Know. Yeah. So yeah, fill so, us in. So it, it says, I how will. toxic is your organization? And then take the quiz button. So I click it. What, what, what happens from there? All right. Let's back up and talk what's behind it. Um, sure. I wrote uh, my third book is called The Regenerative Business. And chapter three is the 30 toxic practices. Wow. And they come from the history of the foundation of companies. And I take them era by era and show you how we got hierarchies, how we get delegation. And by the way, every one of these on list are toxic. Uh, how we got performance reviews, how we got uh, feedback, uh, how we got um, do good kinds of practices to make people uh, feel good about themselves. And I'll list each of those 30 and show where they came from and what they do. I also wrote a book called No More Feedback in Depth. One of those 30, by the way, I have 105 on my list, but I took 30. <laughs> so what you, you get when you go to that button is a set of questions which help you find which of these practices that you probably will not know. I want you to go take this test and so okay. tell me what you get. For sure. uh, and it will come back and will tell you what percentage of your uh, of these practices you're engaged in. And okay. obviously it's designed to get you to read the book uh, and see why and what they're doing to you, why they're undermining and why you think they're good, why you've been fooled, why people lied to you and you bought it, hook, line, and sinker, that what you want are behavior modification. By the way, the reason uh, performance reviews, uh, the incentives, rewards, recognition, all of those things are toxic, is they're based on the study of rats in a maze. Now, if you had rats working for you, they're fantastic. <laughs> if you don't have rats working for you and have human beings, they work against okay. two, three things. They work again against having internal locus control. I feel like I'm in charge of my life because all those come from outside. They work against external considering where I care about you and the customer. Nope, I start caring only about how I'm going to look on the review okay. and they work against personal agency where I initiate what I see needs doing because I'm in an authoritarian culture who tells me how I'm doing. So the book is all about how you really build powerful human beings who can make a huge difference in the company toward where you're going, what your essence is. Uh, and in the world, my, all my books talk about how all this affects democracy uh, and climate and okay. everything it has to do with you know how healthy we are so then i want to because i wrote down performance reviews and i was going to make myself completely vulnerable and say you know that i've used them i still use them with clients so um what's a better way to and i want to make sure i say it right what's a better way to determine you know to to give feedback let's say to it's someone on the team, whether good feedback, bad feedback, you know, and then, you know, set them straight for the next six months or until we review again. I mean, I, I, I'd love to understand and I'll buy the book if it's in there. So, but for the people listening, I'd love to, you know, get a look under the hood if you feel comfortable sharing a little oh, bit. Oh, absolutely. Um, no, I speak about this a lot. First, you have to give up the idea that anything you tell them is better than they could discover for themselves if you had built a culture which people were used to continuously reflecting on themselves. Okay. If so, um, and that it ever actually changes. Now, people have gotten so addicted to this, they don't understand. I build cultures where there's zero feedback, zero uh, performance review, all those things go away. Instead, which is what you asked for, mm -hmm. there's continual education and learning how to reflect on myself relative to the difference I'm making, not relative to what a boss is, because now. Uh, that's the external locus of control. You're in charge. You tell me what you see. I no longer look. I did when I was doing my doctorate, I did a wonderful little study. They'll tell you in a hurry. I took uh, 
18 nine-year-old boys. You can't do this, by the way, now. I'm an old lady, and you were allowed to get away with this horrible, horrible <laughs> research practice. I took nine of them, and we put them in the room, us on the other side of a glass, and gave them this little exercise, which had to do with just moving your hands at a certain time. And this, this is in-depth in No More Feedback, the book. Okay. And then after they did the first round, I, I, my people who were running the study said, well, nine-year-old lying little boys, of course, they didn't say that. How well did you do? And of course, what did they say? We were perfect. We were great. And they said, all right, we videotaped you. Would you like to see how the videotape shows how <laughs> well you did? Sure. And, you know, there's a lot of nervousness and we show it to them anyway and say, now, what do you think? They said, the video's wrong. <laughs> That's not what we did. Now, they're nine, remember? There and you so go. we said, all right, do it again. So we did this. By the third time, they wouldn't do the exercise with us. We took a second group of nine. And after we did the first one, they said they're perfect. Instead of saying we took a video, we said, well, if you were going to improve it relative to what we're trying to achieve, what would you do? And they couldn't figure out how to answer it at first because they were perfect. Sure. But they came up with a, a few ideas like uh, maybe we'll watch each other. Okay, do that. At the end of the second round, we said, well, now how would you improve it again? And they said, oh, all right, let's get in a row so we can't see each other and see if we can learn to do it together. Okay, end of the third round. What would you do now? Let's make it harder. All of that happened in, in less than an hour. That yeah. those little boys who were used to lying to defend themselves were ready to improve. We went back, by the way, with the first nine, did the same exercise, and they changed also. So I that was when I, you know, that was 40 years ago. I then started teaching organizations how to educate people and then have them reflect on where they needed to improve with no nothing from outside go from external management to intrinsic capability mm -hmm. and people become so powerful they grow in the world in a way they can do much more powerful things and children are never susceptible to peer pressure that's what we're doing when we do feedback to children we're teaching them to be subject to peer pressure gotcha wow so then are, were you able to share this with those with Google, DuPont, Intel, Procter & Gamble, those types of oh, companies? Oh, sure. Well, and we go do the research and let them experience it and, you know, come in and do the, uh, so um, the process is one of educating them to reflect on themselves, looking at how it works for them, how they're doing, uh, what they're discovering, and they discover it. I, I do usually tell them the story about uh, Honesdale, Pennsylvania and these 18 little boys. Mm -hmm. But you know how quickly everyone says, yes, that's what's gone on for me. I've never felt like I appreciate the feedback. And then there are people say, but I've learned so much about myself. A year or two later, they say, actually, that wasn't about me. It belonged to the person who gave it to me, not to me. Gotcha. So if you're going to buy one of the books to understand this, go get yeah. no more feedback. Yeah, I wrote that down. That's awesome. Well, thank you. So does that then mean that turnover would tend to drop in organizations because oh, yeah. people then start to become more internally aware? Yeah, you in, um, turnover becomes a non-existent question. Uh, people don't want to leave. And if something happens, because you can't always control who comes in and takes over a company. I've been involved in many takeovers and where people uh, closed down the company or sold it. Mm -hmm. uh, what they discover is they never want to work any other way. And most of them go become entrepreneurs. They create their own companies where people are self-managing, learning, et cetera. Sure. Wow. And we spend a lot of time talking about that because I interview a lot of people that were at one time in corporate America and then they transitioned into, you know, doing this on their own, whatever this is for them. So do you have any advice or feedback for people that may be listening that are like, man, I really 
want to do my own thing. I either don't yeah. know what it is, or I'm scared to make that jump. <laughs> what, what feedback or advice would you have for them, Carol? Well, I don't give feedback and advice. I'll give a plan for you to figure it out for yourself. Okay. <laughs> Cause I believe advice and feedback are absolutely deadly to sure. one to another. I did write an article in Inc. Magazine some years ago that said the biggest challenge I see when people go form their startup and their growth stage and you know working through getting various uh, sets of investment money is they get bigger and they start copying the old problems they left for and they can't see it. Like you at a company, you set up performance reviews, you're still doing it and you could have thrown that out completely if you'd known you should. Sure, so sure. one yeah. of the things I recommend that people do is first do more thinking about what is your own essence? What does that say about where you would be in the world, where you would work? Uh, I see people recommend all the time, go find out where you can make so much, you know, a certain amount of money or people will buy your product. I suggest you not create products instantly, but to think about who you are and have that emerge is say, where could I do that? How could I get that to happen? What would it take to be working that arena? Now, gotcha. what industries lend themselves to that or what offerings? If you're willing to go a little bit slow and, and, uh, and certainly change as you go, because it can be um, that along the way you begin to discover the kind of things I'm saying. Uh, and I do work with tons of entrepreneurs who uh, are way past startup and they're in fifth year, 10th year, you know, sure. they're way past all the investment at rounds wow. of A, B, and C, et cetera. And they just keep evolving, keep changing. So stay awake, keep learning, and particularly go read that chapter. You can download that chapter of the Toxic Practices on Amazon or on my book page of my website. It's okay. free. Oh, and great. you can see, all right, here's the 30. And if you go take the test, you'll have some idea. It was broken once. I think we got that fixed. Let me know if there's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, if there's 105 of them now, I'm, uh, you know, chances are pretty high that, I mean, how do you, how do you like, how do you start? I mean, you just kind of take, look at that test and then do you, you know, like prioritize what really is the most toxic and start with the worst if you have a list of things that you're you know were checked off on that I, i'm just curious how well, you the, how you look yeah at the that. good news is you don't do them one at a time okay. if you didn't one at a time but you're leaving all the other bad stuff you're switching philosophy of business okay. and what you're going to do is move from worrying about that test that you know that that didn't tell you much except yeah i've taken on all the corporate America stuff. It's all in my blood. I believed it, but I don't now. And what I want to do is switch to be an education group. And that's why I work as an educator, bringing people who come in, um, they come in uh, and go through the first year, they begin to learn what the alternatives are. And you begin to implement the alternatives. Like the third year with me, you start to change uh, all the pay and progression. You change how, how people are in charge of their own work, how they become self-determining. All that just drops away. People say, well, maybe we don't do the performance reviews this year because people are really growing. They're uh, creating what I call promises beyond ableness for our customers and our consumers and our distributors. Okay. So you start working on the stuff you want to go toward. Don't try and undo the other stuff. Just get on the horse and go toward where you're going. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's. I mean, I can see. I, I mean, just thinking about it for myself, Carol, it's like a big hill to climb. And it's like, how do you add that into your day? And so I'll, I'll, I'll keep you posted on my progress when I click yeah. on that and see what happens. So um, one other question that I have before we start to come in for landing is you had a blog, a blog post titled seven characteristics of the responsible entrepreneur. So, yeah. you know, um, what, can you share any of those that you remember, you know, yeah, that, I don't remember. I wrote that a long time ago, but I got my <laughs> own answers. I, ne I don't ever go back to what I wrote. I don't okay. ever give the same program. I okay. don't ever give the same talk. I never do anything twice. So that means I'm dead right? If I'm <laughs> using all my old stuff. So uh -oh. if I said right now, 
yeah. entrepreneurs it is a way of living in the world. It isn't a group of people. You can, if you're a teacher, uh, if you're a parent, and my most recent book, The Regenerative Life, talks about the essence of nine of the core roles that make society work. So I would say every human being start to think about yourself as entrepreneurial, which means that you do what I just said. You don't do things twice. You keep looking at what makes sense, what we're going toward, where we're going. Uh, and secondly, uh, I would add, you learn about what I call the energy drains. What are the things that undermine me? And this, I write about this in all my books, the inner obstacles. Uh, so one of the inner obstacles is fear, especially in entrepreneurs. If you come to understand that fear is based on not knowing how to relate to something, if you're afraid of a person, it's because you don't know who they are, where they're going, how, how to get their attention, how to get yeah. their approval. Sure. Uh, or if it's, uh, uh, I just sold a condo and uh, the world changed so much, everybody was overbidding. And I was terrified because I don't know how to relate to that. And I thought, all right, <laughs> if that's it, and that's why you're afraid, you go get educated, you get somebody who can help. So yeah. notice that whatever is inner destabilizing you, there's something you can do about it. So there's the first two, I would say, uh, okay. that maybe gives people a taste. Sure. And, and education keeps coming up in your, yeah. in your vernacular. It's educate, education. So you're coming at this, I'm assuming, Carol, from a spot of if you don't understand something, learn about it so that you can make an educated decision. That's kind of what I'm hearing. Well, education for inner and outer. You just spoke to the outer and okay. there's the knowledge, but there's also understanding. So okay. your ed education is not reading uh, or talking and gaining the knowledge only. It is, how do I make sense of it? How do I uh, go experience it enough, which I even did with this whole uh, condo sale. You go talk to people, get into it, go feel what it feels like, because education to me is, uh, not just the what you can know, but yeah. how it feels when it happens for you and what goes on in your head, your heart, because you're the one who usually makes a mess of things anyway. We think it's other people, but <laughs> this whole thing about we get identified with something. I am a certain kind of person. I have to look yeah. a certain kind of way. That's a toxic inner practice. So education, by the way, the word education, uh, I love words, means is comes from educare, which is to draw out. Duct tape is the same root, believe it or not, in duct tape okay. conducts electricity. It moves things. So when I'm educating, like that's what we're doing right now. I disrupt sure. all the time. D d don't believe that, Dave. Don't believe that, right? And once you're disrupted, you can go experience it. And that's what education is. I just bring you the disruption and some different ideas to go play with. Now you figure out what you're going to do with them. Well, and that's, I love that you had that on your website. It said, courageous leaders today are calling for a disruptive yet effective way of working. And yeah. so I was going to try and understand the disruptive. And so thanks, thanks for sharing that. I mean, it's, it's easy for us to stay status quo. It's easy for us to get in a groove, so to speak, and just exist. And that's yeah. one of the reasons that I love doing a podcast every week is because I'm trying to challenge people to get outside of that, whether it's internal, like you're talking about, or external or a combination of both. But you know, I, 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 I am disappointed when I hear people that haven't really moved the needle in their life in a year, and yet they're disappointed with it, or they're somebody else's fault, like you said. I mean, I, it's kind of on us, right? I mean, yeah. if I don't move my own needle, why, can, why is it Carol's fault? You know, it's super easy to blame Carol, and you know, yep. but, but it just doesn't really make sense to me. So I, I appreciate that you Well, challenged. I believe you have to build the infrastructure so you're doing that, not just say to yourself, keep learning and changing. I create learning communities so that if you're in one of my communities, you're with people who believe in disruption and learning, and we've got them for business leaders as well as change agents. Because without a community, you will be stuck a year from now. Gotcha. That's awesome. Um, so where? what's the best podcast that you have going right now that you um, want to direct people to if they're interested? 
Well, business second opinion is the most lively. I do have interviews with business leaders and investors, okay. and you can find that at carolsanfordinstitute.com. But you can get to almost everything I do on carolsanford.com. It gets to all my books, the free downloads, uh, the free augmented materials, the podcasts by list. And I'm, by the way, I will have starting this fall a YouTube channel, which will be regenerative life hacks. How uh -oh. it is you hack your life for meaning, not necessarily for simplicity and success, the usual use of hacks. How do you hack your life so everything you touch can have more meaning? Wow, that's awesome. That's going to be great. So what is uh, one thing that most people listening wouldn't know about you that you feel comfortable sharing? God, I'm so transparent. I think there's probably nothing anybody doesn't know me. I was raised half, half by my uh, Mohawk grandfather okay. uh, and grandmother. And so it has influenced strongly my life. And, you know, I'm pretty transparent book. I, my books are all half autobiography. So you can see okay. how I got to what wow. I think. So that's great. Wow. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. So if people do want to learn more about you, you said, Carol, the best way is for them to go to carolsanford.com. Is that the best spot to go? And then if you scroll down, you can find the different spinoffs from that. You can find if you're a corporate group or a small business, there's a whole set of stuff you can follow. If you're an individual change agent, you can go there. If you want to listen to podcasts and blogs and guest blogs, like I'll post what we're doing on my website so oh, that people awesome. can find me and you. Uh, so yeah, carolsanford.com. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, I didn't get to half my questions, Carol. So I think I'm going to have to ask you back. Because, All right. Uh, there's so much good stuff here. And I wrote a ton. We of didn't talk about bestsellers, right? I you know, and we I, we didn't do any of that stuff. So I'm good. definitely going to ask you back. So okay. Anyway, thank you so much for this. Um, you know, I, I think it, it, I love to challenge the, the listener, the viewer to be able to, you know, think outside the box, you know, get outside that comfort zone. It's in between the comfort zone and the growth zone is definitely right. the fear zone. And she yeah. alluded to it. And, you know, as entrepreneurs, if you're struggling with that, that's why people like Carol and myself are here to be able to help you through that. She's an educator. I, I come alongside people and mentor as best that I can with what limited knowledge I have. So I'm, you know, uh, if you want a PhD, my gosh, here's a great one. Um, you know, I've learned a ton and hopefully you have taken something away. And the challenge we have every week as we close is to really do something with what you learned because it's easy to go about your business right now and to really forget about what just got shared. So something hopefully, you know, challenged you. I would encourage you to write it down. I would encourage you to share it with somebody, share it with Carol, share it with me, but share it with somebody so that you're really able, you know, to take this education to heart. And then we wanna look at you in a year from now and notice that that needle had changed significantly in your life. So any parting words on your end, Carol? Thanks for your humility, Dave. It's very refreshing. <laughs> well, hey, if I can't learn, then I'm here. I tell people selfishly, I had this podcast so I can learn. So exactly. You know, Me it's too. Just a, it's a bonus if someone else gets something out of it. I got notes yeah. here now. I got to figure out customer loyalty. I got to figure out all this stuff that we talked about. So yeah. uh, thank you so much for sharing. And um, again, we're going to do this again if you're okay with it. I'm up for that. Let me know. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks everybody for listening and we'll see you next week. Take care.